I think. Um, so to say, welcome um, to this afternoon's um, webinar. I'm Chris, I'm the Policy and Public Affairs Manager uh, here at NCBO. Um, and in a moment, I'll be handing over to um, Matt Hardwick, who's a senior risk consultant from Zurich Insurance, um, and his colleague, Mike Henley, a risk consultant at Zurich, um, who will be guiding us through uh, today's webinar. Um, so um, today we're talking about effective risk management uh, for charities um, in 2023. Um, but before I hand over, there are a couple of um, housekeeping uh, points just to uh, run through. Um, so firstly, uh, closed captions um, have been enabled and will be appearing uh, on screen. Um, to turn these on or off, uh, please click on the CC icon and the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. Um, to help with accessib accessibility, um, we will be sharing slides um, for today's event in the chat um, as a PDF. Um, so if it would help, you can download these um, and zoom in and out of the slides as we go along. Um, as I said, today's webinar is being recorded, um, but everyone joining is in view only mode. Um, so your cameras and microphones are both automatically turned off. Uh, and the only pe people you'll be able to see uh, on today's webinar are those who are presenting. Um, lots of people, I'm sure, will have questions to put to our expert colleagues um, from Zurich um, a little bit later. So we will have time um, for Q&A. Um, please submit any questions by clicking on the Q&A icon in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll do our best uh, to get through as many as possible in the time we have, um, but apologies in advance if we aren't able to answer them all. Um, by all means, they do use the chat to share your comments, reflections or your own experiences as we go along today. Um, we're not planning a break, um, but if you do need to step away from your computer for any reason, um, please feel free to do so. Um, and finally, um, we'll send a follow-up email shortly after the webinar with the slide deck and links to all of the things that we're going to mention. Um, so without any further delay, I'm very pleased uh, to hand over to Matt. Thank you, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as, as Chris alluded to, uh, my name is Matt. I'm a, a senior risk consultant at Zurich, and I've worked for Zurich now for the best part of seven years. Um, principally being in this role. So risk consultant by extension means please don't ask me about insurance premiums. Uh, I have no idea how they work. They're a dark art to me uh, as much as perhaps they are to yourselves. Um, my role at Zurich, we, we work almost exclusively within the third sector, public sector as, as well. Um, you know, it probably makes up 80, 90% plus of our time. Um, and I also have the role of taking the risk lead within charities um, for Zurich, which is often why I get involved and I've worked a lot with NCBO and, and, and some of you may, uh, may even have seen me present previously. Um, I'm joined today by a couple of colleagues. Uh, I'll quickly just sort of mention Claire. So Claire's one of our um, sort of account managers, if you like, works, um, works within the charity sector um, and has the relationship from our side with, with NCBO. And so he's here today to potentially help with any of those insurance questions that may crop up that you may have. Uh, and I'm, I will shortly pass over to Mike, who's a colleague of mine within the team, and, and actually Mike's going to be principally delivering the session today. What I would say, and, and echoing what Chris has mentioned, um, today is a safe space. So if you have any questions, you want to put them either into the, the Q&A function, uh, and we will, there's time built in uh, later on to, to pick those up. Um, I'm also, whilst I'm not going to be presenting, but I'll have a look at some of the chat that's going on. And if I can answer questions ad hoc, then I will do, or at least draw attention to them for later on. Um, that's that's probably enough from me. I will pass over to Mike and allow Mike to first off introduce yourself, but then take us through it. Hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon. As Matt mentions, my name's Mike Henley, and I work within the Risk and Resilience team at Zurich. I've been here slightly less time with Matt. I've been at Zurich just under a year now, but prior to this, my background was in internal audit with a focus on controls and risk management there. So I worked almost exclusively with the public sector and charities. So I've got a lot of experience in how the issues, problems, and management of risk is dealt with within that sector. Um, as Matt has said, and Chris has said, please pop your questions in the chat box. Uh, in the Q&A box and we will get to them at the end. Um, but without any further ado, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, so what I want to talk about today is, is risk registers. And the first thing that comes to mind is what is a risk register and why do I need one? Um, 
what's interesting is that the ISO says you don't actually need a risk register. They don't mention it by name at all. So with that, we can all go home. We don't need to worry about risk anymore. It's done and it's finished. If only it was that simple. What the ISO says is that risk guidance needs to be documented. Um, they list a range of ways in which you can do this. There's comprehensive suites of programs, risk management tools, all the way down to the simple risk register that's managed on a spreadsheet. What is important to note about all of this though, is that the risk register is simply a tool for monitoring risks. It won't solve the problems on their own uh, and is only as good as the information that goes into it. The primary function here we're looking at is, is to allow them to track compliance targets, uh, potential pitfalls, hold information, dates for actions, and current controls that are in place to mitigate risks, as well as um, holding people accountable and making sure that we have a good handle on our key 10 to 15 strategic risks um, that are affecting the organization. We don't want this register to be an unruly document. We don't want it to get into the, to the hundreds of risks. We don't want to consider every potential possibility. We want to be looking at the big, the bad, and the ugly, the things that are keeping you awake at night and stopping you from achieving your strategic objectives. In terms of a time frame, we're looking at that period around the next 12 to 18 months, the sort of medium term view. Anything uh, under 12 months, we should have already picked up. We should already be addressing it, and it might have moved from a risk to being an issue. And anything past 18 months, we're looking at something that's a little bit more intangible, hard to deal with, um, and maybe a bit remote and subject to such rapid change that uh, mitigation is pointless and I know I'll be preaching to the converted here when I say that over the past few years we've experienced such rapid change within a lot of sectors that um, it doesn't need bearing how, um, how frequently it can happen. The document itself um, doesn't necessarily need to have risks on them all the uh, that remain on them all the time. You can roll things off and on, but if the risk register is being used correctly, the risk register that you have in 12 to 18 months time should look different because the world has changed and the environment in which you operate in is um, gonna be substantially different to, to the one that you're looking at now. Uh, if we can flick on please, Chris. Um, so how should it be used? We've got three key points here. This is a live document, it should not remain static. We're looking at regular review of the risk register through the risk scores, controls, and the actions. And has the risk appetite of the organization changed? So what do we mean by a live document? The basic way of putting this is what's important today may not be important tomorrow. Update this regularly. If you're looking at your risk register now, and it's the same as the risk register from two or three years ago, something has gone wrong. Your risks will have changed, your objectives may have changed, and the whole outlook of the organization may have changed. In terms of the review, we're looking at risks. It's, uh, it's unfortunate to say, but risks may become less mitigated over time as you encounter new regulations, changes in operating environment, and this is absolutely fine. It doesn't represent a failing of anybody within the organization to say, actually, this risk is, is now slightly more risky than it was a month, two months ago, and we need to find new ways of mitigating this in order to ensure that we're covered to the best of our ability. Are the controls that are in place, are they current? Are they and not future actions? Are they, in, are they effective? And do we think that they're working? Are our actions smart targets? Um, and by smart, I mean specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Uh, are the dates set in the future? And are these actions assigned to the right person? Are we updating them regularly? And are we following up on what needs to be done? In terms of the risk appetite, has your organization changed this recently? What does this mean for your risk register and the risks within it? Are they still relevant? Are they over mitigated now, under mitigated? And are the risks um, being sought in line with strategic objectives? All the risks within your register should link back to those strategic objectives and the goals that you as an organization wish to achieve. Um, next slide, please, Chris. Uh, 
Um, a lot of you will probably have heard the words strategic and operational risks. Um, and I know I did when I first started in the sector and went, why is this important? What's the difference? Um, why are we talking about this? Surely a risk is just a risk. And um, there's some re really short form uh, definitions there for you. Strategic risks stopping you achieving your business objectives, whereas operational resist risks result from the day-to-day -day running of business operations. Strategic risks can fall into business risks, such as your organization fails to do an adequate market research or makes a poor decision, isn't financially stable, your recruitment is poor, you hire the wrong people, things that are affecting the overall running of the business. There can also be non-business risks, which include market competition, external economic factors, changes in consumer taste, uh, although that may be slightly less relevant for yourselves. Operational risks tend to fall into that data. They run in and include things that will protect the long-term plan. Oh, I've seen a few people in the chat say it's frozen. Um, yeah, um, Mike, if you could just run through this slide again, probably just because um, we you did cut out briefly. No worries at all. Um, I'll start from the top. Um, so strategic risks can fall into business risks, such as your organization failing to do adequate market research, uh, making poor decisions, not being financially stable, uh, your recruitment being poor, you hire the wrong people. These are things that are happening within your business. And strategic risks can also come from outside of the business, market competition, Um, apologies, everyone. I think we may have lost um, Mike. Um, Matt, I don't know if you're able to pick up, perhaps, and then uh, then if Mike is able to rejoin, perhaps he can um, go from where, where you get to rather than this um, wait I, and hope he comes back. I can, but Mike, you're on my screen, so are you there? I, I'm, I'm back. Can everybody hear me? Can people yes. hear me? I don't know what happened there. I didn't touch anything, I promise. It, uh, it all just went went black on me for a second and then I came back straight away so maybe that was zoom telling me to to go away but um, right, well, do you take it away from where you got to then <laughs> <laughs> uh, so sorry for the third time operational risks uh, these tend to form into the day-to-day -day running of the business and can include things like poorly trained staff human error poor internal processes and controls fraud things that cause risks within the organization but don't stop you achieving your overall targets or those long-term plans so what we're going to find is the strategic level if you look at the di diagram is that top um, picture as it were flowing down into the service uh, operational tactical level whatever you call it within your organization and what should happen is those risks flow up and down that um that tally and you might have a second section there in the middle if your organization is large enough when risks at that service level do become too severe they should be escalated up to the strategic level and be managed at that level um, and conversely if a risk on your strategic risk register falls down in priority it can then be moved down to the respective service level um, as it no longer proposes that long-term strategic impact to the organization uh, if we can move on to the next uh, slide, please, Chris. So all of this is well and good. Um, it's great me talking about this, but what should actually go into the rest register? What should it contain? Um, there's a few very basic um, points there that I think if you haven't got these in the rest register, you should probably go and take a look at. And I'll run through each of them um, now. But what I have done is base this on the um, NCBO risk register template, which is available to all members, I think I'm correct in saying, and is available from the website and is a very good base uh, for any risk register they're using. So the first thing you need is a risk code or identifier. It's really simple. How do we know which risk we're talking about? Um, you may have three or four finance risks. You may have two HR risks, three for governance. Um, and if someone just says the governance risk, it can, it can just get a little bit confusing. So just something so you can really quickly and easily identify the risk that you're talking about. The risk description, this is the risk itself. This is the thing that we are concerned about the most. 
and it needs to be specific but i will touch on this a little bit more later but what you really want to avoid a very generic sweeping statements like it may stop us achieving our goals. Uh, initial risk score, likelihood and impact. So if we do nothing pre-mitigation, what, what do we think the impact and likelihood of this risk taking place is going to be? Um, what are the current controls that you have in place? Uh, what are we doing now to stop this risk from happening? And I, when I say now i mean what is currently in place not we're in the process of doing this this will be implemented next week this needs to be a snapshot in time that gives you a, a fair and reasonable assessment of where you're sitting in terms of your current controls so if something isn't in place yet that's absolutely fine just make it an action and as soon as that action is completed move it across to the current controls uh, the residual impact likelihood so post mitigation We've implemented our controls. They're all current and in place. Um, how likely is the risk to take place? And is what's the impact now? Um, have we made a lot of difference? Or actually, have we looked at our controls and said, we maybe need to do more work here? Uh, actions required. So this is, again, the SMART targets, actions for upcoming works, um, include dates, make people accountable for these. And this is just the process we're going through now to further mitigate that risk. Uh, the target risk score um, is it's in the middle, I think, of the NCVO risk register, but I think it should be at the end. Um, so you have initial risk, residual risk, moving on to the target score. So if you think of it as a risk journey that way, um, this can be aspirational. You might never get to your target risk score, and that's absolutely fine. But as long as you know you're mitigating towards something, and if you do reach your target risk score and think, actually, there's more work that we can do here, Again, absolutely fine to uh, ex exceed your target risk score. Uh, the risk owner, who has overall accountability for the risk, so when you're speaking about this, who is actually in charge, and the review date. When are we next looking at this? Uh, place an emphasis on people to follow through with, with commitments with these review dates. Um, if we just jump on to the, to the nice extra slide, which is the next bit is nice to haves. You don't have to have these. Um, these are a few extra items that you can place into the risk register. They are not essential by any means, but they provide you an additional lens to look at your risks through. So a risk category, some people like to link these to departments or other strategic objectives, but it's a useful way to ensure your risks are linked to strategic goals for the organization. Uh, RCA or root cause analysis. Some people include this as a column, but this is something that you should be doing for all of your risks. Um, you have to act a little bit like a child when you get to the cause of a risk and ask why. Um, anybody with young children, I would imagine, is used to this question quite a lot. Why do I have to do this? Why is this a problem? Why is this a problem? Um, if you ask why five times, you will get to that root cause um, and the heart of the issue that you need to be addressing. This will allow for better results and mitigations. It was initially put forward as a Toyota thought experiment and I think it's a really effective way, if not to work on your risk register, to get teams and people thinking about risks and what actually are the core problems to the organization. Potential consequences. What will actually happen if this risk comes to pass? Is it financial damage, reputational damage, loss of staff? Writing these down can hi help highlight uh, areas of severity of these risks and focus your mitigations. It can also highlight if you've got something on the risk register that actually isn't that much of a, of a problem. If you're looking at your risk register and thinking, this doesn't worry me, or the consequences don't seem that severe, it potentially shouldn't be on the risk register. And the final one there is risk mapping. It's a really nice way to chart your risks, um, ranging from the, the ones down the lower end up to the more severe. Uh, shows you where potential additional effort is needed. It also highlights your big hitters that um, you need to be focusing on uh, from day to day through the risk process. And it also shows you where your scoring needs could be a bit better. Have you got all of your risks with the same residual score? <laughs> Sorry, Remy, I just saw that comment pop up there, wishing your kid would only have Y five times. Um, I, I can empathize with, with you there. Um, sorry, as I was saying, uh, risk mapping, yeah. 
are all your risks stacked on top of each other? Do you all um, do you all have the same overall score? How do you know your priorities if things aren't laid out correctly? Uh, on the next slide, please, Chris, we're going to talk a little bit about the risks themselves. Um, so I've I've tried to boil risks down to four key things. They need to be focused. They need to be specific. They should be quite quite concise and they need to be risks, not issues. So I'll go through those one by one. Um, focused, make sure it's focused on what, one area. Um, so often I go to places and see that a risk will start talking about HR and end talking about finance. Um, how are you supposed to know where, what the risk is, what the focus is? If you're jumping between these departments, um, going from finance to HR, ending on procurement, it doesn't help you identify those risks. You may have two or three risks there, and that's absolutely fine, but try to focus to one core issue. Specific, uh, I mentioned before about not making generic sweeping statements. Um, identify the actual issue you are trying to address. Don't put things like stop us delivering our service. What might stop you delivering your service and why? Um, not all factors are equally important. So you need to make your risks manageable. Um, it's very easy to say that, oh, this could happen and that could happen and the other could happen. But actually of the, the three or four things you highlight, maybe only one of those is actually gonna stop you achieving your objectives at a strategic level. Um, concise, it links very much to the specific, but have you narrowed it down to the key elements? You don't want your risk to be five, six sentences long, you know, war and peace. These need to give you the big hitters and the highlights very quickly. And then risks, not issues. The difference between a risk and an issue is, is quite simple. If it's an issue, it doesn't belong on a risk register. Um, it needs to be dealt with right now an issue does it's already happening it's live an issue may spark other risks but an issue itself uh yeah sorry bau is business as usual um it may spark other risks that then need to go into a risk register whereas a risk um is something that may happen a point of uncertainty within the organization that you need to be focusing on when you pull up your senior leadership team and you all get together, the risk register should form the agenda. So it needs to be those big key risks that you're talking about. If you're not talking about it on a regular basis, it's not one of your big risks. But now we know what a risk is, how do we control it? Uh, next slide, please, Chris. Um, I get to get up on a little bit of a soapbox here. Coming from an audit background, this is one of the areas of risk mitigation that I feel gets misrepresented the most and, and is most often an area for improvement. Uh, there are three types of core controls, detective, preventative, and corrective. Preventative controls, as the name suggests, stop things from happening. Um, some really good examples of these are segregation or separation of duties, um, potentially in raising and signing off invoices, uh, firewalls, passwords, work review, things that stop a risk happening before it comes to fruition. Detective controls are aimed at finding problems before they become problems. Examples of this can be internal audits, bank reconciliations, inventory counts, all good examples of preventative controls. And a corrective control doesn't happen after a risk has come to fruition. A corrective control happens after a detective control. So a detective control highlights a problem. You then implement a corrective control to fix that. Um, so some examples quite commonly are pol new policies and procedures, training, disciplinary actions, um, and pa patch management uh, if you're working from IT. A control needs to be happening now. It needs to be live. It can't be something, because I mentioned before, that's happening next week or due to happen after sign off that's an action and it isn't affecting your risk score. Um, so often you see people in controls listing things that are going to happen in six, um, six months time and it's impacting their risk score. 
But if that risk was to happen to, tomorrow, that control hasn't come into place. Uh, it needs to be measurable and it needs to be quantifiable. Um, coming from an audit background, we used to go in and test. And if you can't test your control, how do you know how effective it is? How do you know if it's impacting your likelihood or impact scores? So if you're doing training, do you keep a record of that? If you're doing the bank reconciliations, are they available to be looked at? It also needs to be a consistent event. So no one-offs, not we had someone come in three years ago to talk to some people about this risk, that, that doesn't work. It needs to be happening on, on a regular basis. Well, I say regular, it should be consistent. Um, cyclical training is a good example um, of when this is happening. And the final one is you don't want a false perception of effectiveness. If the controls aren't those four, one of those four things above, it's going to give you a false perception of what's happening within your organization. From an audit, insurance, safety, regulatory point of view, that really isn't helpful. And if it isn't in place, make it an action and time bar it. And then when it's in place, just move it across those columns again. Um, the last thing you want is to think that your organization is mitigating risk exceptionally well, but actually it turns out that nothing has actually been implemented as of yet. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please, Chris. This is one of the, I think, one of the areas that's the most difficult to get your head around, um, the scoring of risks. It, what do the numbers mean? It feels great to score a risk, add a few mi mitigations, bring it down, think an excellent job's been done. Um, and as I said earlier, the, the target score can just be aspirational. Um, so you might not ever get there, but it, it does give you something to aim for. We need to attach meaning to those scores. Has your organization set out what a, if you use a five by five grid, what a 25 is? What's a 10? What's a six? What's that in terms of financial, reputational, legal, uh, regulatory damage to help your organization actually assess the overall likelihood and impact at each of those stages? Red isn't bad. Uh, nobody likes to have a red score on a risk register. I think everybody assumes the negativity. Everybody thinks that it's it's bad. It's It shows you up in a poor light if you're having to present and you say, I've got a red risk here. It means we're failing, but we aren't. Uh, we need to be honest here. Has our environment changed? Do we need extra support? Has new regulation come into place and has the risk grown? It's absolutely fine to have a risk that you think is sitting at a yellow. Assess it, look at it and then go, actually, it's moved up to a red, and we need to find new ways to mitigate this risk. Be honest with how you look at your risks. Is our scoring consistent? Does everyone understand the technique and method for scoring within our organization? We know this isn't an exact science, but they need, everybody needs to be playing by roughly the same rules. Um, I mentioned before, do we have personnel parameters, financial, reputational, so we can give it a really solid attempt at guessing that impact and likelihood. And the final point there, use all the numbers. If you have a 25 point scale, that means you can use all 25 numbers. Um, you don't want everything stacked on top of each other. You, the number of risk registers you look at that something goes from a 25 to a 20 and then the next risk goes from 25 to a 20 or 16 to a 12 and everything just ends up stacked on top of each other. How do you know where your priorities lie if all the risks are scored the same? There's nothing wrong with scoring a risk at 17 uh, or 14 if you feel it needs that differentiation. Just as there's a scale there between uh, one and 25, there's also a scale between 20 and 25. Um, people don't like doing it because of the, the maths involved. They don't like looking at a, a three by four thing and calling it a 14, but there are 25 numbers there for a reason. Uh, and as you can see from the graph on the right hand side, uh, this is a form of mapping for your individual risk from inherent, which is the eye in the top right of the, of the graph there, no mitigations, residual risk, following your mitigations, and the T is the target. This is where you want to end up. This is the risk journey. Um, but you may never get there. It, the world may not let you get there, or you may exceed it. It's absolutely fine, but it's a good way of going, I think we can get here, let's continue mitigating. Um, 
Next slide, please, Chris. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about risk mapping as well. I know I've mentioned it a few times, um, and I was very aware that people may not know what I was. So we've got risk maps there. Uh, on the left-hand side, it's um, a little bit difficult to understand what those risks mean, which numbers they are, how do we work out what's what. But then if you look to the right-hand side, you've got the risk map. So from a top right, that would be your critical risk, uh, 25. Moving all the way back down towards the left-hand side um, of your mitigated risks there, and you number them. So you can easily identify where your priorities are. And when I mentioned before the risks stacking up on top of each other, if you had six or seven risks that were all scored at a 12, there would just be one big dot in the middle there. And how are you supposed to differentiate your um, priorities if that's what your risk map looks like? This is a really nice way of looking at your risks. Um, I would encourage everybody to do it. It helps to highlight the, the key priorities of the organization. Um, and just the next slide, please, Chris. Um, this is the last slide. So just some really key takeaways here. Um, make sure you're addressing risks, not issues. Um, concerns of uncertainty, not things that have already come to pass. If you have an issue, it needs to be being dealt with in a live environment uh, at this very second, whereas risks, we can continue to mitigate. Controls need to be quantifiable, measurable, and happening now regular review of the risk register um, this is a live document and it should be treated as such um, it should be different a year from now to how it was um, things happen and that's absolutely fine but if you're not looking at your risk register at, i would say at least at every senior leadership meeting and it's forming that agenda how do you know if you're identifying the correct risks how do you know if you're on the right track make sure your risks reflect your organization there is no one size fits all risk register here. You need to make sure that your risks follow your strategic objectives and help you achieve your goals. Um, and the final question point is, if you aren't sure, please ask someone else in the organization, someone who works in another industry, sector, company. You have a, a fantastic resource here in the NCBO and Zurich, and we have a dedicated risk team who can help. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, um, you've obviously got us now for 20 or so minutes, I think. Um, but thank you very much for your time and listening to me for, I think about 35 minutes, but I'd like to open it out for questions now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks um, very much um, for that, Mike. And yeah, we've got about 20 minutes. Um, we do have a lot of questions though. So um, please do keep them coming and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, let me just, uh, so, um, one question that came in, I think particularly useful from a sort of charity perspective, um, would you be able to say more about the respective role of trustees and the board versus, um, uh, the CEO and, um, senior management team in sort of managing, compiling, auditing strategic or operational risks? I'll try that. Assuming my microphone is not too muffled um so both layers have a role to play um but fundamentally risks are managed via um officer manager level the trustees have a degree of oversight into how risks are and they need the assurance that risks are being managed appropriately um but you wouldn't expect to have trustees who are proactively engaging in the direct management of those risks, whereas your CEOs, your senior managers, et cetera, are likely to be um, heavily aligned to the direct management of those risks. What the trustees need is the assurance that the risks are being managed. Um, someone once referred to it as, we need to know that the weeding is being done but not doing the weeding. And I think that's a really good analogy in terms of that, that difference around what a trustee is doing versus uh, say other parts or the layers within the organization. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone have anything to add on that? Or if that's 
Uh, no, okay. Um, so there were a couple of questions about the number of risks. Um, so I'll just pick out um, one of them. So I struggle to understand how a register is likely to have just 10 to 15 risks. Um, if you're trying to capture both strategic and operational in a reasonably large size charity, then I anticipate a much larger register closer to 100. Am I getting something wrong? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to field that one, Matt, if you want. Go for it. Um, so th the difference between the strategic and operational, sorry if I didn't make this clear, they should probably sit within different risk registers. So your operational sits at the at the service level and, and will probably contain more, um, more risks. Your strategic, though, should probably be the 10 to 15 big hitting things that are keeping you awake at night. Now, it, it's very easy to say stop at 10 to 15. You may have 16. There may be a case where you have 20. But what that needs to be is a manageable number for you. And usually we see uh, around 10 to 15. That's that's the ideal. And those are actually the big problems. A lot of the times people have things sat on risk registers where they go, mm, actually, I can probably get rid of that now. You know, have you got a a lingering COVID risk that still sits there or is a risk sitting on your strategic risk register that could actually be dealt with by the service level operational teams. So each team service should have their own risk register and they should help to feed into a strategic risk register of the really, really big issues that you need your strategic team looking at. So you don't want them looking at the day to day operational things. You do want them looking at things that affect the longer term of the organization. Great, thank you. Um, so there's a couple of questions, and I think I saw some in the chat as well about target scores. Um, and the kind of perhaps if you could talk a bit more about the value of, of setting target scores and, and how you can go about um, setting them. Yeah, sure. Um, so if you think about, about it, it, we've got our inherent score, which is we do nothing. We're at, let's, let's say, 25 for an example, or where it is critical as we can be it it couldn't be any worse um, we've implemented some um, controls and now we think we've come down to a to an 18 for an arbitrary figure um, but actually our risk appetite as an organization this risk maybe pertains to financial is that we're actually very close to risk in this area so we need to bring that down further so we may target bringing it down to say an eight and to do that we may introduce more stringent controls work with greater expertise so it's it's aligned to the risk appetite of your organization um, you may have something where you have a risk that's over mitigated where you've decided that you're very open to risk in say a technological space uh, but all your technological risks uh, are really mitigated heavily, which is then harboring, uh, sorry, not harboring, um, stopping you from seeking opportunities in that area. So it, it needs to be roughly aligned to your risk appetite. Um, great. And I guess connected with that sort of um, that sort of approach. And um, we have a question here um, from he so they often find it straightforward to come up with mitigations uh, to reduce the likelihood of a risk, um, but find it harder to come up with mitigations to reduce the impact. And so what do you have any examples of where the impact has been um, mitigated or something that, you know, would would, would be an example of that? Um, yeah, fine. So I think I think there's two points here. The one the one point around this is it is a lot easier to to feel like you're impacting a likelihood. I, I understand that. And when you think about impact, I think a lot of people always go to the worst case scenario. And I've yet to come across a risk that if we went to the, the very nth degree, doesn't end in the building burning down, we've all run out of money, everybody's lost their jobs, everybody's injured, uh, someone, someone dies. What we want to think about here is the most likely worst case scenario. So on the, on the average day, what's the most likely worst case thing to happen? And, and quite often that isn't, the building falls down and things like that. But in terms of a control that imp uh, affects impact, uh, a really good one is people wearing hard hats on a building site. It doesn't change the likelihood of someone hitting their head on something or someone being dropped, but it, um, it does change the impact of them potentially not sus sustaining an injury such as that. Or having fraud controls in place 
impacts both the likelihood and the impact. So you may be hit by a fraud, but you may be able to identify it quicker. So the likelihood has gone down, but so is the impact of that potential risk when it occurred. Great, thanks, um, Mike. I've um, got a question here um, from somebody who says they've just taken over as um, CEO of a membership organisation and were surprised to sort of see they don't already have a risk register. Um, so do you have any advice for someone who is uh, going to have to create a risk reg register from scratch rather than sort of build on what they've already got? Yeah, that's um, so you get to do the fun bit, really. You get to build it yourself. That's great. Um, the, the first thing you want to do is, if this is a strategic risk register, you want to get that strategic leadership team in a room. Uh, and the way that we facilitated projects like this at, at Zurich, and I think it's a really effective way, is to start getting people to write down their concerns, their worries. Uh, and if you have 10 people in that room, you may get 70 to 100 ideas. Obviously, that's not manageable, that's not feasible. But when you start looking at these ideas, you'll find very quickly that there's consensus on a lot of things. So a group of those down and some of them fall into wider risks so from those 100 ideas you'll probably get about 12 really key risks that you can then start fleshing out um, so that's the best way i would think of starting and then you'll have to go and look at the in mitigations that are in place so the processes and procedures that your the organization has um, it may also be helpful if they I don't know if they have nothing at all, but there may be some some risk charts or risk maps or things that are a little bit older, but could give you a, a rough steer of where you need to be looking and talking to department heads is always helpful as well for the big concerns. Thank you. Um, so I've got a question here um, about, uh, it's essentially about transparency around sort of public statements on risk. Um, do you have any advice um, about best practice with um, that transparency um, in risk statements in your sort of your trustees annual report? That you could have that one, Matt. That's that's your yes. area of expertise. That is that is. So my my argument and an argument that I have had and put forward and been yeah um, agreed with is your risks that you're articulating as mike alluded to risks are things that haven't happened yet these are areas that we as an organization perceive could happen and perceive could have significant impact i believe they are commercially sensitive and so they do not sit on a public document um, and shouldn't need to be shared shouldn't need to be included um, and as i say that that is an argument that i have put forward on behalf of organizations that we've worked with to to ensure that risk registers stay in a closed part of a report that that may ultimately have you know wider open public availability uh, but your risk registers are fundamentally around your own activities your own concerns and as such um should remain confidential um i often say you all you're potentially doing is giving headlines out to the local press uh, that may or may not want them um and, and it's it's not that it's not the place to air your dirty washing. Great, thanks, Matt. I think that's a really clear answer for people to uh, uh, to pick up. Um, I think there's a few questions um, around scoring. Um, so, so I think the charity commission, um, perhaps before, uh, had a sort of formula where it was. Um, you score the, you multiply likelihood by impact and then add impact to kind of get to a total score. Um, but perhaps if there's, a, I don't know if you've got a bit more around sort of the best way to score, does that approach work? Are there other ways to sort of um, effectively score um, your different risks? Um, the, the best way that I've seen of scoring is, is a five, by five it's i know some people use six by four and i think jeric give out a six by four matrix um which which again is very good just with a slightly longer impact i think it is axis but five by five it's it's having some meaning assigned to those numbers and really doing some work on what you think those impacts are going to be and how damaging the financial legal reputational impacts are um get your get your experts in a room. Um, there is actually a question in the um, 
in the chat box there that I was about to reply to, but I'll do it here now, um, about risk velocity and al analysis. And someone had been asked to do this by their auditor is what it was. And um, you can also conduct these, which is effectively a time to impact um, study, which is the point at which, from which an event occurs to when does the organization feel the impact and how much will that initial impact be? Um, it's a little bit more of an advanced thing to do, but it can be very helpful for identifying the overall impact of key risks to an organization. I hope that answered the question. I, well, I, I was also going to um, uh, flag that one. <laughs> so I'm glad you answered it. Um, I, the question here, which is a, a kind of an interesting one. So, um, the, and it's about the, should it always be five by five um, in terms uh, uh, for a small organization, could it be sort of three by three, for example, or, or is that kind of the the um, you know, five by five always the best way to do it? I, I think five by five is good. It doesn't really um, matter about the size of the organization. I think a five by five matrix just gives you a little bit more spread. Um, I know someone's popped in that they don't totally understand the five by five square, and that's absolutely fine. Um, when you get into three by three, if you've got... 10 risks and only nine boxes you've already started things stacking up on each other and how do you know where those priorities lie as i mentioned Zurich do a, a six by four um, which obviously tops out at 24 but gives you a few different combinations again that's absolutely fine i think five by five is the best from my personal opinion it just gives you enough differentiation it's it's easy enough to use in terms of following it through for the for the numbers um and I wouldn't change it just because you have a smaller organization. And likewise, I wouldn't make it any bigger because you have a big organization because then it, it becomes too disparate and hard to understand. Um, the square in and of itself is just a way of gauging the overall likelihood and impact of that risk um, from a pre-mitigation, post-mitigation, and then where we want to end up. Um, quite often you see the top right corner will be red, the, the strand through the middle will be amber and then the bottom left will be green and um, the green risk when a risk is green it's it's less impact less likelihood when a risk is red it's more impact and more likely to happen that's and then everything in the middle right um just on scoring um we do have a question here about asking if you could explain the scoring um so we've got 25 squares um and we can go from one to 25 but just wanted a bit more how how you score and where you place the numbers this is on this will be set by your organization's risk appetite um by red lines that are being put in place by the strategic teams um there's a whole variety of things that go into this it, i i can't say this is how you should score your organization because it'll it'll depend on what your organization's tolerance to risk is um but basically, there should be some red lines in place that for, hypothetically, uh, a finance risk, we don't want to cross this line. or And without any mitigations on this risk, we're currently, well, we're way over our risk appetite, so that should affect your score in there. Um, but there should be some gradings of reputational damage, legal damage, uh, HR impact, financial impact, regulatory um, to help you guide your um, initial scorings. And then again, there should be a consistency of application for mitigations that are put in place. Um, so, you know, we've done training and actually the, the training seems effective. Uh, good example is if you run a phishing scenario and you have 100 people within your organization and bef before any training, you, you get... 80 out of 100 people click on the link, you do a phishing awareness training, run another scenario, and actually now only five people click on the link. Well, you've got an effective mechanism there to, to, to reduce the likelihood of an event happening. And you've also probably reduced the impact as well because of the awareness of, of people and they're more likely to know, oh, I did something wrong, I will report it now. So it's just then how you gauge that as an organization. As I mentioned, it's not a perfect science and you know your organizations and your spheres better than anybody else so if you think that something is inherently risky you're probably right if you think something isn't as inherently risky odds are you're probably right um matt i don't know if you've got anything further to add on score in there i know it's quite an intangible topic sometimes yeah it's as you say it's intangible it's um you know risk starts out as one person's gut feel and then it's 
it's about having the conversation the whole the whole principle and um mechanics around risk management whether it's the risk register or or scorings or parties of it um it, it's all about having that conversation with with colleagues with peers with um stakeholders st trustees you know people with vested interest and balancing your gut feel versus their gut feel and then coming to a discussion conversation and and ultimately the the tool the risk register tool and indeed the scoring within it is um is a way of recording that and, and a way of you know sort of starting the conversation but it it yeah it, it isn't the primary purpose if you like what what we want to see is that that discussion takes place and then that that discussion is is logged is registered and, and your risk register is is that tool for it great thanks thanks both um for uh that um so just uh, somebody, I think, just in response to an answer, someone's asked, are the, so the colours are different depending on our individual risk appetites. As in the colours on the... Uh, yeah, I assume the the, the, the green or, or red. Um, not on the scoring matrix. What you'll find is that the bottom left corner will always be green, the middle strand will be amber, and the top corner will be red. And... Um, just because it, it highlights severity, but what you might find is that when you're scoring a risk, um, your risk appetite sort of says, you know, we're, we're open to risk in certain areas and we're not open to it in others, which should then help you identify how much mitigation is needed. So if you're in the red area and you know that you're not open to risk in that area, you know you need to come down to an amber or a green, but if you're in a green area and you know they are quite open, you can maybe do some things that are a little bit more risky and you can push the envelope a little bit more. Um, to try and succinctly put that. Right, um, thanks, Mike. Um, so I think, um, and, and by the way, thank you for all these very um, succinct answers. We've managed to get through a lot of questions in our 20 minutes. I've just got, I think, time for one more. Um, would you ever say a risk register is overkill for a small organization? No, <laughs> really succinct. <laughs> um, you, you might not need a, a, a massive, long risk register it, it again it's organizational dependent you know if it's if it's two of you sat in a in a garage you probably don't need a full-blown risk register but it's always good to get risk on the agenda and those big hitting things as i mentioned should be the things that form the agenda so if you're if you're talking about it a lot it's probably a risk it's probably a concern to you um i would never personally say it's overkill to have one but it's hard to say it depends how big the organization is i guess um but it's always good to get risk discussed i'll say it that way great thanks i, I would just add to it and, and sort of echo mike's comments it, it needs to be proportional so you know if you are the two people in a garage as mike said um you need you need something as an organization you know we we need to have a clear understanding of what our risks are um but but you may not need to invest in software to be able to do it or whatever you know it, it just needs to be a fairly simplistic table that articulates your key concerns key threats in order of achieving those objectives brilliant um well thank you very much um both uh for all those um answers i hope that sort of helped help people out for with the questions um they had um so just to sort of um, finish off, um, we can have a few um, resources that we'll signpost you towards. And I should say, by the way, that all of these, all of the things that we've mentioned um, on this list um, are going to be um, shared um, in the follow up email. So you don't worry about um, what the links to all these things should be sent them. And I think Chanel is also sharing um, some of these in the chat um, as well. Um, but before we do that, um, we're about to send a two question snap poll um, just to get your initial thoughts um, on how uh, you found today's event. Um, and if you'd like to provide additional feedback, um, a short survey will appear in your browser when you leave the meeting. Uh, and for us, it'd be really great to hear about the things you enjoyed, where we can make improvements uh, and also what further guidance and support would be helpful um, from NTBO. Um, as I said, links to everything we're about to mention um, will be shared in the chat um, and uh, included um, in the follow-up email. Um, if you just um, bear with me. 
Um, sorry, I've lost. Uh, <laughs> I've lost the slide, so I may just have to go through this without them appearing in front of you. Um, so the first thing we've got um, is a link to uh, that, that we'll send you um, is a link to Zurich's own uh, risk management help and guidance pages, and um, which includes a handy three-minute video guide uh, to risk assessments uh, for non-profit, uh, so for not-for-profit organisations. Um, and you can also find out um, about Zurich's specialist insurance offer uh, for charities and voluntary organisations uh, on our trusted supplier pages. Um, we have um, NCVA's guidance on managing risks, um, looking at the role and responsibilities of your trustees to ensure they have good governance arrangements in place uh, when it comes to risk management. Um, we've also got um, the risk register template, which uh, I think lots of people are asking um, for a link to that. Um, but that is uh, an exclusive NTVA member only um, resource. Um, and if the Zurich and NTVA guidance wasn't enough, um, we've also linked here to the Say Events and Risk Management Made Simple guide. Um, and of course, it goes without saying um, it's important to make sure that you're aware of the requirements of the Charity Commission um, when it comes to managing risks and you don't fall short of um, expectations. Um, NCVA also has a huge programme of online training, uh, which NCVA members benefit from a 30% discount on. Um, so a couple of courses that link back to uh, managing risk effectively um, are our trust, charity trustee induction and refresher, um, our supporting good governance, um, safeguarding essentials and charities, uh, and our data protection um, essentials. Um, and you can find uh, out more about our training offer uh, on the NCVA website. Um, and finally, for any questions and queries that you have that you can't find answers to online, um, you'd be more than welcome uh, to contact our small charity help desk um, via phone or email. Um, and as I said, all of those um, resources um, are going to be sent to you um, in the follow up. Um, if you're not yet a member of NTA, we'd love to have you join um, our community of over 17,000 organisations um, from the biggest household name charities uh, to the smallest community groups. Um, our members are at the heart of everything we do uh, and we really need um, <laughs> to work with you to, to, to make the best case on things. Uh, we exist to make your lives that little bit easier so you can focus on the things that really matter and make the greatest impact to the communities you serve. Uh, and more information about becoming a member um, can be found on the NTVA website. Um, before we sign off, um, on behalf of my colleagues at NTVA, um, I'd like to give a special thanks to Matt and Mike for their time and expertise today. And a huge thank you to you uh, for joining us. Um, so please do spare a minute um, to share your feedback um, with us, uh, which you'll be able to do uh, as the webinar ends. Um, but for now, um, enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Mm -hmm.